All right. Uh, welcome, welcome all to Grand Rounds. Um, it's going to be a wonderful talk today on uh, cultures and UTIs of the elderly, and it's uh, certainly a subject that I struggle with. So, a few excellent speakers today. The first one is Dr. Sade, who um, you know, did most of his medical education in Beirut, but he also did a, a fellowship and a residency here at Case. Uh, he's had multiple awards for excellence in teaching and as well as excellence in research in his time in Cleveland. Uh, most recently, he became the medical director for infection control as part of the quality services of the university hospitals. He also had the daunting task of teaching the antibiotic stewardship that was an intern on geriatrics. Besides him, we also have Dr. Singh today. Um, she did her internal medicine residency at Wild Cornell University in New York and her geriatric medicine fellowship at Brown University in Rhode Island. She's been involved in many quality improvement projects and has had many publications and poster presentations that have come as a result of that. She currently uh, serves as the Chief of Geriatrics and, and Palliative Care Medicine, Director of the Geriatric Home Management Program, the program lead for the Geriatrics Inpatient Consult, and most importantly for her, uh, she can be seen teaching residents as part of the ACE Teaching Service. So please welcome our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Constantin, for agreeing to read all this about me. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to talk about something pretty simple that we have to, you know, face every day, uh, mainly ordering urine cultures. Uh, so I'm going to approach this from the aspect of uh, stewardship, uh, basically diagnostic stewardship. Uh, so um, these are objectives uh, for today that I will share with, with Dr. Singh. Uh, so uh, first, um, why is this something uh, uh, that we think is important. Why do we want to talk about this? Mainly it's because it affects uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, lives every every year. So every year in the United States, around uh, 3 million um, patients acquire infections in the hospital. And that leads to uh, around 36,000 deaths. And among those, uh, C. diff is definitely a very important one. Uh, so... Uh, so this one one way to prevent, or the most important way to prevent C. diff and antibiotic resistant infection and hospital acquired infection is to use antibiotics uh, the way they're supposed to be used. So, uh, so this antibiotic stewardship, choosing uh, when to use antibiotics, and uh, the diagnosis is is a very important part of that. So the CDC has identified uh, these urgent threats. Uh, among bacteria, so I'm pretty sure uh, you have seen at least uh, a few of those if you have been, if you have seen, you know, patients in the last uh, few months. Uh, C. diff, uh, carbapenem resistant bacteria are, are one of the, of the most important, and these are considered urgent threats because of uh, how, many, uh, how many lives they affect and how many lives they take every year. Uh, so, um, one uh, one very important or uh, utilizer of antibiotic is uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria. So asymptomatic bacteriuria is having a positive urine culture uh, without having uh, symptoms of urinary tract infections, and uh, this leads to antibiotic uh, overuse. Uh, just because um, you know when we have a positive culture result, um, we are all anxious, or many of us are anxious to treat. Uh, so this is a study on uh, uh, bacteriuria uh, that was done in, in hospitals, around 2,700 patients. And uh, among patients with asymptomatic bacteriuria, 80% received antibiotics. So there was no difference in the outcomes of these patients between those who received and those who did not receive antibiotics, uh, including mortality, readmission within 13 days, emergency department visits, or C. diff infection. Um, do not, uh, I, I wouldn't stress so much on the C. diff infection just because it, it wasn't powered to detect that, but the most important point to see here is that uh, uh, there was longer length of stay in these patients uh, than among uh, those who did not get treated for asymptomatic bacteriuria. So uh, for those who were treated four to five days uh, versus three days for those, for those who did not get treated. And the factors that, that uh, were associated with treating more these patients is those that are 
usually associated with asymptomatic bacteria. So older age, altered mental status, dementia, and urinary incontinence. And basically, there's no difference in outcomes at 30 days, but there's longer uh, length of stay, and this is, you know, a very important uh, drive of, uh, of uh, the cost of care. So shifting a little bit so toward uh, another population, this is a nursing home uh, population. So uh, this is a retrospective a review of uh, around 600 nursing homes uh, with around 130,000 uh, residents. Uh, so I want to I want you to look here mainly. So they uh, they look to see. Uh, so they try to to see which uh, or how many patients. What is the percentage of patients in each nursing home? Uh, that uh, received a urine culture within the 14 days prior to this review, uh, uh, so uh, you, which you can see here. So these are the percent of nursing home patients with urine culture in the 14 days before assessment. And on, on the y-axis, you have the percentage of uh, uh, patients who received antibiotics uh, in the nursing homes in general. So and as you see, there's a direct correlation about how many received a urine culture and how many were treated with antibiotics. We're not uh, talking about how many had urinary tract infection symptoms or how many had positive urine culture. We're just saying that those who overutilize uh, urine culture testing will also overutilize antibiotics. So that there are direct relations for this that doesn't really go through whether they did or did not have a urinary tract infection. Uh, and uh, so and, uh, that doesn't uh, also stop for uh, uh, antibiotics used for usual uh, urinary tract infections. So it's not just for nitroferentoin, for example, or bacterium, but that's for uh, also uh, quinolones and other antibiotics. So what is diagnostic stewardship? What uh, what is this concept? And uh, I, you know, I want to introduce this. To, to those who are not very, very familiar with it, just because you know you're going to hear about it a lot in the next few months on the wards. Uh, so basically, it's similar to antibiotic stewardship. So there's some uh, coordinate, uh, coordinated guidance uh, and intervention to improve uh, the appropriate and timely use of microbiologic diagnostics. So, so when to order uh, urine cultures. Um, or any cultures in general. So basically, it's choosing the right test for the right patient and at the right time. So the first question is, is the test appropriate for the clinical setting? Uh, do we need a urine culture now? Will that affect the treatment? Do we need a chest x-ray now? Will that affect the management? Uh, does this patient in particular need this test? And at the right time, meaning like so, sometimes some tests will not be available until days or weeks before at a time where, uh, you know, they're not going to be very useful. So that's also taken into consideration. Uh, so that, uh, so we, there's multiple steps um, to, um, to apply or where, where this can be applied uh, from uh, uh, selection of the patient, uh, depending on the patient's symptoms. So the patient doesn't have, have symptoms of any tract infection, like doesn't have dysuria, for example, uh, or other uh, symptoms that means that they don't need a uh, urine culture or a urine analysis, basically. So uh, nothing will replace that step. Like everything we're doing here or everything we're talking about doesn't really uh, take the place of your clinical judgment. It's just a way to supplement your clinical judgment. So, so this is basically one, maybe the most important step there. Uh, so uh, avoiding doing the test in the patient who doesn't need it, that's kind of the most important step, basically. Uh, to the specimen collection and processing, avoiding contamination. Uh, don't get a urine culture for, or a urine analysis, for that matter, from a urine catheter that is pre-existing. What does it mean, pre-existing? I mean, I would say if you want to get a urine analysis, a urine culture, uh, just do it from a very fresh uh, catheter, like change it. Uh, so there's different studies about different, you know, time periods. 48 hours seems to be uh, the time that uh, uh, comes up a lot, but there's not really, you know, a strict uh, um, time period for that. Um, so uh, avoid contamination. Uh, so that's also part of uh, of, of uh, stewardship. Positive results 
scan will lead to antibiotics regardless of whether you think it's a contamination or not in general. Uh, so uh, also lab thresholds for culture identification. That's why, you know, in our lab, if there's a contamination, there's more than two bacteria that doesn't get reported because that's an element of antibiotic stewardship. It doesn't mean it's negative. It just means that it's contaminated, right? Uh, so one, one approach that we are doing there is, uh, or that's already been applied, is using uh, boric acid tubes, coated tubes, which will lead to uh, suppressing the overgrowth of bacteria that can lead to uh, less false positives. Uh, and um, uh, help and in interpretation, which, you know, what we talked about uh, for the lab, and then uh, optimize empiric antibiotics, uh, uh, something that uh, we are working on with the, uh, or the antibiotic stewardship team, Dr. Dr. Hajat and, 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 and Dr. Tombush here. Uh, you will see progressively more uh, guidelines on the antibiotic stewardship website about using empiric, empiric antibiotics. There's already the one for urinary tract infection, and there's uh, an upcoming one for pneumonia, and there will be more. So that's a good resource. And also, uh, review, review the antibiotics after you started, like after 48 hours, go back to the, see whether the patient actually needs it or not, the cultures have come back negative, then maybe you want to stop it there. So there's steps also after uh, the culture. Uh, just a small uh, graphic about the role of diagnostic stewardship in parallel to antimicrobial stewardship uh, in terms of uh, controlling antibiotic use and leads to, leading to resistance and antibiotic overuse limitation. Uh, going to, st to skip this one, Dr. Singh will, will talk more about it. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, so what, what can happen if, if we have a urine culture, if we get a urine culture in an asymptomatic patient? I mean, the biggest risk there is you, may, you might get a positive. So if you get a positive urine culture, that will lead to treatment again. Uh, so, um, and that will lead to side effects, that will lead to antibiotic resistance, that will lead to cost, uh, in addition to the cost of the urine cultures themselves, but also the cost of antibiotics, length of hospital stay, and the other factors. So the intervention that we are going to, uh, that we are working on applying now, and that will probably be done uh, in mid to early April, um, is uh, uh, what we call reflex during cultures, meaning that the, the steps or the, the orders that you see on the on an EMR, especially for inpatients, they will change uh, around mid-April. And uh, you, will, there will be, you will not be able to order urine culture on its own, except for some indications that we will talk about. In general, if you want to order a urine culture, you first have to, uh, you have to order a urine analysis. And if you have positive criteria, which are more than 10 white blood cells uh, per high power field, positive local site esterase and positive nitrite, that will lead to a urine culture if you have ordered it. So not every urine analysis will lead to urine culture. Uh, uh, just if you already selected urine analysis plus culture if indicated. Uh, you'll still be able to order urine culture for certain patients, mainly pediatrics, uh, pregnant women, uh, patients who have upcoming uh, urologic procedures with risk for mucosal breach, and patients with ANC less than 500. Uh, so uh, neutropenia and severe neutropenia. Uh, other patients will either get a urine analysis alone or a urine analysis with culture if indicated. Uh, so um, uh, you will also be asked to enter a symptoms or an indication for, uh, for the culture. Uh, basically, uh, you know, if you have a suspected uh, urinary tract infection, so that's basically when, when do we suspect a urinary tract infection? And a patient who has a fever, uh, if, there's a, if there's a fever and one or more of the following, urgency, flank pain, uh, shills, uh, shaking shills, urinary incontinence, frequency, uh, hematuria or suprapubic pain, uh, then, uh, you know, we recommend ordering a urinalysis of a culture if indicated, or if there's no fever but there's dysuria, and then two or more of these symptoms too. Uh, so this is a saying by um, uh, Osler, 
uh, listen to your patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. This is kind of the, again, there's nothing that will replace your clinical judgment. All this is designed to supplement it. Uh, so common conundrum. So I mean, we, we get asked these questions a lot uh, when you know when when we're taking that uh, show to the road. Uh, first, uh, what about the old patients who have delirium or falls? Well, the IDSA does not recommend testing for or treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria. There's no evidence that you know falls or delirium um, with, uh, treating asymptomatic bacteria in these patients will, will lead to any positive outcomes. Uh, so for patients with renal transplant, within one month of transplant, there's not really evidence for or against testing or treating. After one month, the IDSA recommends against testing and treating for asymptomatic bacteria. And other kidney, and other than kidney, uh, like other solid organ transplants, the IDSA recommends against testing or treating. For neutropenic patients, if they are low risk, uh, so basically anything more than a uh, hundred. Um, for less than seven days. Uh, so the risk uh, from asymptomatic bacteria is similar to that in non-neutropenic patients. Uh, for high risk, they don't have a recommendation. They are not recommending to, to treat or, or to diagnose it. But, but we are being a little bit permissive here, and you know, we kind of decided to go with, uh, uh, with the cutoff of 500 after discussion with our colleagues from, from hematology. Uh, so uh, some evidence about uh, what uh, what this approach can can help. Uh, so uh, this approach has been tested in, in the intensive care unit setting, in emergency department setting, in nursing home settings, in general medical surgical setting, in neurologic clinic. So in, in a lot of different settings. I'm just going to to present some of uh, some of the studies that were done. Uh, so. Uh, this study was done in, um, in five ICUs in a large academic medical center, and in this, they, they cultured only if, um, if the patient had more than 10 uh, white cells per, per high power field. Uh, so again, we are being a little bit more permissive here where we have other criteria too. But in this setting, uh, we can see that there was a decrease in urine cultures uh, and uh, uh, also a decrease in uh, and the catheter-associated urinary tract infections after the intervention. And it is pretty clear, you know, how you can see the drop in both utilization of urinary, of urine cultures and also in diagnosis of cauties. Uh, so this is another um, a study that shows actually how uh, the change in, in this uh, urine culture uh, uh, ordering practice affected antibiotic utilization in the intensive care units. So you can see that before and after the, after the um, intervention, you have a decrease in how many urine cultures are uh, performed, uh, how many bacteria are diagnosed, and uh, there's a trend toward a decrease in the antibiotic uh, utilization here. So you can see like how it was going up and then uh, there's a change in the in the, in the slope, uh, and more importantly, there was a change in the new uh, di in the new orders for antibiotics. There, so less less patients who received antibiotics. Uh, so uh, this is um, this is this was done in, in three different hospitals, where they did a soft roll roll in of so uh, so they they introduced this approach, your analysis plus culture if indicated, and at the same time. Uh, they kept the possibility of doing, you know, urine culture just like before, so they just added one more test. And in these, like, we can see that there's already a preference toward utilization of the reflex testing, either uh, even when you already had the other testing at the same time. And there's a decrease in what they call positive urine cultures. Uh, I'm sorry, there's an increase in positive urine cultures. That means, like, they... Uh, or the percentage of urine that comes back positive, meaning that more urine that were sent came back positive. So there was an increase in the, in the improvement in the clinical suspicion. So people were um, uh, able to identify then when a urine culture is not needed better, and then more of the urine that, were, uh, that came back were positive. I'm mixing a little bit my words. I'm confused here, so I'm not sure if that's clear for, for everybody. 
It's just that basically it shows that they had better clinical suspicion, and also they prefer to use the reflex testing even if they had the other tests. So the main risks is, uh, uh, or the main conundrum there, like the you know, points against this, is a risk of false positive and risk of false uh, negative. So risk of false positive means like uh, pyuria can be present, and uh, it's, it's a pretty common symptom. And it's not specific. It's a pretty common finding. It's, uh, it's not specific of urinary tract infections. So 30% of young women, but even 90% of elderly patients and long-term care facility and 90% of hemodialysis patients can have a positive, can have pyuria. That means even if, if you have a urinalysis that's positive, which leads to, your, to a urine culture that, that's positive, that doesn't mean that the patient has a UTI, and that's where you know, the importance of also using our judgment. And the second risk is the false negative, meaning uh, having a urine culture rejected even though we, the patient actually needed it. Uh, so here, so if one criteria is present, uh, pyuria or leukocytosteroids or nitrite, uh, less than 2% uh, of the cultures will be positive. And if all three criteria are absent, it it's gets more closer to 100% of negative cultures. Uh, so um, one way to improve this is to exclude controversial populations like pregnant women and patients with upcoming urologic procedures. So uh, finally, again, uh, going back to Osler, there's three phases to treatment, diagnosis, diagnosis, and diagnosis. So uh, diagnosis is the most important phase of uh, treatment. Uh, so I'm going to keep the questions for later, uh, uh, so after Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how we are implementing this program, this diagnostic stewardship that you heard about at um, CMC and other system hospitals. So here I'll take a few moments to talk about our CAUDI journey, uh, which uh, we undertook in 2012. Uh, in the initial part of the project, uh, the interventions were mostly around uh, dissemination and standardization of knowledge and practice among the nursing staff around catheter care and UTIs. From 2016 until 2018, the interventions were around, again, dissemination of knowledge around catheter use, judicious catheter use, and uh, introduction of alternative devices making the equipment available in our system hospitals. And um, we worked on launching the Foley order set, and that went live in 2019. So with the launching of the Foley order set, I would like to show you how that has affected our Foley utilization rates. And this graph shows beautifully how our Foley utilization rates have been steadily decreasing. And at this point, I'd like to give a shout out to all of you for supporting this initiative and uh, helping us bring down our utilization rates. So which brings us to the next part of the journey, which is diagnostic stewardship. After you have um, prepared the soil, so to speak, of uh, judicious catheter use, the next step logically is, well, are we doing a good job of testing? So that's where diagnostic stewardship comes in. And um, we heard about uh, what is the right thing to do and why it is the right thing to do from Dr. Sade's talk. The question here is, how do we do it? We all know the right things to do, right? But it does not always translate into practice. So I'll try to answer that about how we can do it. And to help fill that gap is um, implementation science. So, Evidence-based medicine essentially guides us on the facts of what are the right things to do. And quality improvement, basically how it works is it uh, looks at recurring problems and the processes and then tries to fix them. So it's going backwards. Implementation science is um, what helps us do right things right. So it marries the two, EBM with QI and then 
you get to study, you know, what's the right process to get to the right result. So to do that, uh, we started off first with figuring out what's the goal of a diagnostic stewardship program. Um, so as you can tell, it is to reduce overdiagnosis and reduce overtreatment by increasing urine culture appropriateness, right? So there are a number of steps that you have to do or go through to reach that goal, urine culture appropriateness. And so to um, get more clarity on that, um, we figured out what are all the things which affect that big goal. And then um, we created these four areas of potential change. So the steps are, first you have to order the test, and then you have to collect the sample. You have to transport the sample, and in the lab they have to process the sample and then report on that. Each of those areas of change, of potential change, have smaller steps in them. So when you consistently do right things in the smaller steps, then only you can get a significant change in the bigger change area. So we laid out all the steps that could be impacting our overall goal. So for example, uh, at the stage of ordering, you know, we might be ordering urine tests routinely if they are part of order sets, admission order sets, or pre-op order sets, or post-op order sets. Um, so we aren't necessarily using the right judgment when we make that decision to make, place that order. Uh, we all know that you, know, you need appropriate indications to place the order, but we don't stick to that all the time. Um, and so also what makes it challenging is there's a number of orders in the EMR. So you can order a urine test by just ordering urine analysis or by just ordering urine culture or by ordering the two of them together. Um, and as Dr. Sare mentioned, there are special populations where you would need to test regardless of if there are or there are not symptoms. So um, a mix of all these smaller processes when done optimally or suboptimally makes the bigger um, change area harder or easier to manage. So that's how we set about uh, setting these smaller process out, laying them out so that we could intervene on them. So going back to the ordering process, um, you heard a little bit from Dr. Sare, and I would like to add a little bit more. So when we order the UA, we often see patients that they are started on antibiotics and there's a UA in place, um, but not necessarily a culture. So how good is a UA to predict a positive UC or a positive urine culture? Um, it has a sensitivity of 81%, but a specificity of only 44%. So um, not all UAs uh, turn out into positive UC, but you have already started the antibiotics on that patient. Then UA is an even poorer predictor of UTI, because UTI is a clinical diagnosis, not a lab diagnosis. So um, they have, UA has only 31 to 46% positive predictive value. Um, and that is partly because of the high rates of ASB in the population. So UA by itself doesn't do uh, much to help us in making a diagnosis or treating or not treating UTI. Uh, similarly for UC, if you just order an isolated urine culture, it has a 5% percent false positive rate, and you end up treating them, um, and also a higher false negative rate, again, due to um, if the sample was collected when the patient was already on antibiotics or uh, problems with sample collection and processing. So by themselves, both of those tests are not of much use, and uh, a little bit to see about how it impacts the patient. Um, so two studies uh, I have quoted here. They looked at adult inpatients in the hospital in one study and looked at all the urine analysis orders. 62% of uh, the orders were just UA by themselves. 82% of them were placed in asymptomatic patients. And 30% of those uh, patients got treated. Uh, when we looked at a study for isolated UC orders, and that was a study in um, older patients in the emergency room, uh, and they were all there for non-infectious causes, but they got a urine culture order, 14% uh, of them. 
and they turned out positive, and 71% of them ended up getting treated. So um, knowing what processes were involved, our challenges, uh, we laid out our challenges and how to tackle those. So our challenges were mostly based around knowledge and practice gaps. So knowledge and on not adhering to best practices-based indications, and um, ordering or collecting samples, again, not in alignment with indications, but maybe with how the urine appears. So it's cloudy urine, it's foul-smelling urine, it's high-colored urine, and off, get, um, and off a UA gets sent. Uh, also, again, as I mentioned earlier, the EM EMR doesn't make it any easier. Uh, there are multiple ways to order the test, and um, when you don't use the appropriate indications, then you're saddled with the result that you end up treating. So um, we decided on um, how do we tackle these problems, and to answer that question in part, we looked at the literature, what other places are doing. So there aren't a lot of studies. Um, we found one survey which uh, asked acute care hospitals, and about 80% of the participating hospitals were academic, so sim similar to us. Um, so they said that about 44% of them said they had published indications for ordering a urine culture. Um, only 17% reported requiring an indication for ordering a UC in the EMR. And 54% reported configuring or changing the EMR to preferential ordering of the uh, reflex UC. So we decided we'll go with education and um, part of the education strategy is ongoing. You know, it's part of the training that we get as trainees, um, ongoing CME educations. For nursing discipline, it's uh, training and in-services um, periodically uh, offered. Um, and the new thing, so you see a red asterisk there. All things in red asterisk are the new things that we are doing. So you have updated algorithms on the intranet developed by Dr. Hojat here. Thank you. Um, so you can use that resource to guide you on your decision making. And these are just the snapshots of what those algorithms look like. So then um, I look to the literature again, uh, this time at uh, the literature of implementation science to see, well, how good is the educational um, strategies? So I came up with a few numbers here. The literature threw up a few numbers. So when you disseminate, when you do a mass dissemination of education in the form of printed materials, let's say your pocket cards or your pamphlets uh, or even the intranet, um, then it has an impact um, of maybe ranging from 4 to 14 percent uh, on how the process gets changed. So um, education does not necessarily translate into a behavior change. And uh, so that's what we found, that education, passive education, um, can affect change by 4 to 14 percent. But um, it is not as costly, and it has a high feasibility. So those are the advantages that this mode has. The other way of imparting education is what Dr. Saleh did just now, opinion leaders, right? So a content expert comes and talks to you, and um, so by themselves, um, they may not be as impactful. But if you add on academic detailing, which means the content experts comes to a group of uh, um, providers um, in their setting and talks to you face-to-face, -face, gives you feedback, that bumps up the impact uh, of that intervention to 10%. So maybe from 6, they'll go up to a 10%. Um, it, the cons are that it is costly and it is resource intensive. Um, the other way to do it that you couple an opinion leader with um, some performance gap analysis, so you do at the initiation of your intervention, you see where are, what is current state, what are we doing? And then after you have imparted the education, you do audit and feedback. So it's a process of regularly assessing uh, did that intervention translate into change behavior and then you give feedback. Uh, from the high performing institutions, we know that um, when feedback is done right, it is impactful. So what is the right kind of uh, feedback? It's something which is actionable, something which is timely, 
Uh, it is individualized, and most importantly, it's non-punitive. So um, that was for the education, and then we knew that by itself, education wouldn't help us much. Um, so we looked at the EMR, uh, and again looked at that survey to uh, inform us and what we could do. So the literature does talk about ways in which you can modify the EMR, but there aren't uh, specific statistics attached to it, just because there aren't a lot of studies done um, um, in this way. So you can use passive CDS messages. CDS is clinical decision support. Um, but passive messages, when they pop up, they may cause alert fatigue, and you get used to it, and nobody reads it. The other way to do it is you have informational alerts which require an action. So you have to click on something to say, yes, I agree, or I read it, or I'll make a change, and then it lets you move on. But those will be considered intrusively, intrusive and may add to the click burden, may not unnecessarily change the practice. So our strategies were, and some of these have been uh, ongoing. So you already have a reminder attached to the orders that you place. So if you have a UA order, if you look at it closely, it tells you uh, to put it on the indication. There's also availability to text in your indication in current state. What's new here is that now we'll be requiring a hard stop for indication. So uh, we, we will be needing our um, clinicians to put in an indication before they can place the order. And our process of measuring and studying this intervention would be uh, audit and feedback. So how are we doing on the use of the new order? So going back to the next phase is the collection and transport and to look into how do we make changes in this area. Uh, we again figured out, well, we need to know what are our goals. Um, so the goals are to reduce contamination and reduce overgrowth. And I'll quote a few studies just to show how it impacts um, what we do. So um, a study looked at um, contamination rates and uh, the ideal time that they say from collection to processing of the sample is two hours or less. So the study looked at samples which were processed four hours or more and they found a 10% increase in colony counts. Um, and when the samples were processed like 24 hours or after, uh, the colony count grew up by 135%. So, uh, yeah. Um, and then there are many challenges associated with uh, what you do for collection and what you do for transport. Our challenges were, um, again, knowledge gaps. So what is the best way to collect from what source, you know, because sources could be a number of sources. It could be a catheter. It could be a non-catheterized patient. Um, and then the knowledge gap on how it impacts the results and how do those results impact our patients. So if we don't know what what's the distal outcomes and how they affect, then, you know, we may or may not be able to change our practice most um, efficiently. And then we had the challenge of the practice gaps, that there was a huge variability among the staff on how they collect samples from whichever source. Um, and a study did look at uh, nursing staff in an institution, and about 83% of the respondents said that, well, we don't send the sample from the drainage bag. We always send sample from the um, sampling hub or port. Um, but in that same study, and the same respondents say that they observe their colleagues doing that only 50% of the time. So there is a gap in what we do um, in regards to what's the best thing to do, but there's also a gap in perception and practice. So we perceive we are doing better, but we may not be doing so well. Um, and also there was uh, a huge variability in the equipments that we have on our floors in the hospital and in the system and, and how to best use them so that there's no contamination, there's no breakage of seal during transport. All those issues were a problem, are a problem. Uh, so um, from the system issues, so I talked about the various collection devices. And um, 
So if you don't have a preservative in your collection devices, the next best thing is to regulate the temperature. The temperature is about 2 to 8 degrees. Um, not all floors have the same uh, proximity to lab. So you may have a place where the lab is um, downstairs in the basement, or you may have a floor where the lab is, uh, you have to drive out to that lab. Um, so how do you maintain that, um, you know, temperature during storage while the, patient, the sample is waiting collection? So regulating temperature is not a feasible way to do it, and so that's why as a system from the Quality Center, we decided on using the bacteriostatic devices, collecting devices, and transport devices which went into effect last week. All right. So our strategies, uh, we again looked at that survey, what do other people do, what do other uh, hospitals do. Uh, they almost all the respondents said um, that we report, we train our nurses on appropriate urine collection techniques. That is part of standard training, and that's what we do as well. Um, so the new things that we are doing is you will be using devices with the chemical preservative, which uh, we have already started last week. Um, make that equipment available in all our system hospitals, in all our floors uh, here. Um, withdrawal of alternative equipment, so the things that we are not going to be needing should not be available uh, for use. And then again, uh, periodic audits of are you using the device and what are your challenges, and then um, work on those to improve that. So um, education to patients on midstream uh, urine collection is is uh, not very common in the inpatient setting, and it's really hard to implement that. And there was a study which looked at uh, that um, in hospitalized patients, less than 5% of the patients performed the procedure correctly. Um, and that same study reported a contamination rate of 60%. So um, the next step was lab processing practice. What, what are the interventions we could look at um, to change that area? And Dr. Saleh talked about urine reflexing, so I won't talk about it um, more. But I'll just add that reflexing by itself does not do a great job um, just because there's high rates of um, colonization and uh, contamination and a pyuria even. So if your reflex trigger is white cell count, then pyuria is very common, especially as you get older, um, white cells are more prevalent in the urine. So the fix is you, you add the indication. So you have to know why you're ordering the UA in your patient, and that's why we build the heart stop for the indication in the new order. So when you use that approach, um, studies have shown that um, it reduces overall ordering and thereby reducing unnecessary therapy and improving cost. Um, another study looked at um, what was the improvement. So when you place a UA and based on reflexing criteria, the urine culture gets cancer. Um, so they, the lab had 35% lesser cultures performed in a year. And that translates into a lot of things, um, direct and indirect costs, and increasing value for the patient. So that was in that change area. And our strategies, again, we looked at that survey. 39% uh, of the hospitals said that they proceed with urine culture even with prolonged specimen transport. That's a lot of hospitals saying that yeah, we, do, we don't do a great job of timely transport. Um, and 66% reported availability of reflex uh, culture orders. So what is our strategy going to be? Um, so far, historically, we have been doing the same, I think. We don't uh, discard our samples if the collection to processing time is two hours or more. But since we started using the bacteriostatic devices last week, um, that should help because then the timing is not as important because when you have a sample in a bacteriostatic tube, um, they can stay longer, at least 24 hours if not more. Uh, what are the other things? Uh, so to improve the accuracy of testing, uh, we will be implementing the reflex uh, urine uh, culturing um, order in the EMR. 
we will configure the EMR to prioritize the reflex order so that that order shows up on top and prompts you to pick that order as opposed to the other orders which will be buried beneath it. And over time, we'll remove all the other orders. So um, to look at the impact of um, lab reporting practice, again, I'm quoting two small studies. Um, so in one study, they had a educational memorandum in the EMR fixed to the report. So once your union culture showed up in the results, within 48 hours of the results, uh, you had a memorandum pop up which talked about the harms of treating asymptomatic bacteria. And just with that intervention, they saw a reduction in antibiotic utilization, which was a significant drop. So from about six days of therapy of the antibiotics, it went down to about 2.2 days of therapy. So that translates into safety uh, things for the patient and cost for the institution. Um, the other study which looked at was the strategy of requesting urine cultures from the lab. So they would not release the urine culture um, results and the clinician had to call the lab if they thought that the patient was at high risk of having a UTI. And just with that strategy, again, they saw a reduction in the treatment for ASB from as high as 48% to 12%. So this is, I, I don't expect you to read it, and I'm not going to go into details on this slide, but this is just um, an algorithm which our lab uses on how to report on the culture. So while they have a great way of figuring out, you know, what needs uh, to be reported and how, I think it may be useful for us to have a educational memorandum or something in the EMR which tells you more when you get a result that this is a contaminant or um, maybe you should repeat a culture or something like that. We haven't have a, had a consensus yet, but that is some of the things that we could work on next on our stewardship. Um, so again, we looked at um, the survey to see what other people are doing on lab reporting strategies. So 90% of the respondents reported uh, uh, said that they report a mixed urine culture and they don't do any further workup with it. So there would be no organisms and no um, uh, medication sensitivities, which is what we do here as well. 44% um, uh, of them reported using cascade sensitivity in positive urine cultures. 44% uh, reported with selective suppression of certain antibiotics. And 29% reported all antibiotics tested. So our strategy here could be, again, we don't have consensus yet, but those are uh, areas of potential discussion and uh, moving forwards to figure out what we need to do. So selective su suppression of antibiotic susceptibility results or use of cascade reporting, and maybe build a comment in the EHR when there is a positive urine culture, which helps to guide clinicians on making better management choices. So um, central to all of this is measurement. Measurement and studying. Um, and measurement is an exciting and um, a very exciting area for me at least. Um, it's a whole way of thinking that in each of these change areas and in each of these processes in the change areas, how are you going to be able to say, well, I did this intervention and this was successful? So in order to say that, you have to have measures and you have to track those measures. Um, and so I didn't go into details, but that is the way that you would do ideally to keep all these PD SH cycles running in all these change areas. And eventually, these wheels will move your overall goals in the direction that you need to go. So um, finally, the most visible intervention to all of you is the order, um, and this is what it would look like. So there are three things that you absolutely need to put in. One is, um, you know, what is the source of the sample? What is the site? Uh, catheter status, does the patient does or does not have a catheter? And then uh, indications. What are your reasons for sending this sample? You can also use the special population uh, box 
if you need to. And then the signs and symptoms box looks like this. So um, I'd like to give credit to all the team members of our diagnostic stewardship team here. Um, thank you. And we'll take questions now. So um, if a patient comes in the hospital and has a catheter placed, and someone orders a urine culture, and the culture is positive, even if the patient does not have any symptoms, does that count as a CADI against the hospital's report card? That would count as a CADI in the hospital's report card, and as things stand now, what that means is that we are dinged for it. Right, so one way to decrease CADIs is to not do inappropriate urine cultures. Well, first, don't place catheters and take them out when you should, but don't do urine cultures on patients with catheters without symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I know that other institutions, they've, they've reduced their CADI rates pretty significantly by controlling urine cultures, which it seems like maybe what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are at that phase, yes. Yeah. Actually, um, so we, we, we associate delirium and falls with urinary tract infection. However, uh, uh, that's not uh, you know evidence. So there's no real evidence to base that on. And delirium is not considered a symptom of urinary tract infection for 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 this. And there has been studies in patients who had delirium and uh, as like the whole or, or are the main symptom of diagnosis for a UTI and treating uh, bacteriuria or treating them as UTI did not lead to any improvement of outcomes. Uh, so delirium and falls are not considered as part of uh, the symptoms for UTI. Can I add something? Contrary to popular belief? Yeah, yes. That's a myth, yes. So I'd just li like to add something. So yeah, pop that's popular belief and... Uh, <laughs> In the nursing home patients who have dementia, who uh, you know doesn't complain of dysuria but has decreased PO intake, a little bit of confusion. The next day they have a low grade fever. The next day they're in the ER with urosepsis. So yep. I guess that's that's what I was talking about. I mean, that, is that is that uh, change in, in behavior an early symptom of a UTI? So it's not a specific symptom for UTI. Right. So there it can be, but uh, the key to uh, workup is figuring out. What are the other contributors to the delirium? And um, maybe you'll find, so if you find something, let's say you find a metabolic problem, AKI or you know, hypercarbia, you control that and the patient's symptoms would improve. So you give them a period of uh, monitoring to see what the patient is doing with your intervention. If things are still going south, then yes, it, it makes sense to treat the UTI, um, which could be an ASB. So that is what they recommend. Um, even the Choosing Wisely and the AGS uh, recommends this approach as to figuring out what else is causing or driving the delirium and keep UTI as the last. So yeah. So it also depends on what do you see in the UA. Uh, pyuria, but just by itself, is not a great indicator. But if you have pyuria and nitrite, then the specificity of the UA actually goes up. Um, so in that case, you could use your judgment and treat. Uh, but what I'm trying to tell is, you know, when you link, make a linear association between UTI and delirium, what you risk is premature closure. So you make that um, diagnosis, and then you are not working up for other causes of delirium. So the patient gets harmed not only by treatment for UTI, but also on missing out on other causes of delirium. There's a lot in the ER that... Uh, well, that's my point, right? We are, we receive a lot of free <coughs> patients who have been pre-treated along a variety of diagnoses. Somebody with stroke and breath has already received bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics. Yep. This patient probably that I would receive has already gotten 
Right, the common fits of the ER. The postmenopausal women come in with a yeah. clinical syndrome and have an abnormal ER analysis, and then quickly their syndrome is attributed to a UTI, and that's the premature closure. And, that's and they, they improve. Yeah. That's the problem, right? Sometimes they don't. Yeah. The delirium improves, so there's, there's reinforced behavior here. Yep. That as clinicians, we see improvement with all that they're doing, so it becomes uh, yeah. a learned, sort of a learned behavior. You use That's a theory oh. telling us something completely different, or at least. Yep. So it is very, I mean, you, uh, having a positive urine analysis and a positive urine culture is very common in, in the elderly, right. and also delirium will be. Is common. So presenting with a delirium and having a positive analysis, so there's an intersection there, but it doesn't. But there's no causality, or at least it's not established. And uh, I mean, they they will get better because also of the of, other of, of other things like rehydration. Um, and just because we're out of time, I'm going to cut the conversation off because it's a great conversation. It's after one o'clock. The take-home messages: don't, don't 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 order urine cultures unless there's a good indication. Yep. yep. And, when including symptoms. and don't create symptomatic bacteria. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.